Welcome to Back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Ian Roth. And I'm Tracy McRae. The Human Genome Project was an international collaborative research program whose goal was the complete mapping and understanding of all the genes of human beings. All our genes together are known as our genome. We all have one. With the human genome sequence complete since April of 2003, scientists around the world have access to a database that helps accelerate the pace of biomedical research and in turn improves patient care. And here to discuss the medical advancements in the 15 years since the Human Genome Project was completed is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Eric Green. Welcome to the program, Dr. Green. Happy to be here. This is um, an amazing new world, and it's 15 years that we've been talking about genetics. That, reading that script, that was surprising to me. Well, actually, we were talking about genetics for much longer. Sure. We've been talking about genomics only for about 30 years because that's how young the field is. But you point out a really important historic milestone, which happened 15 years ago when we completed this audacious effort called the Human Genome Project which at its core was about reading out the letters in the human genome. The human genome is all of our DNA, it's our blueprint. So this was our first real readout of what, what, were, what were those letters and how were they ordered because it's the order of the letters that contain all the information for making and operating a human being. How does knowing that human genome affect patient care? Why does it matter? Well, so much of medicine, and I'm a physician, uh, and I learned this in medical school, so much of what we were taught in medical school is about treatments that work for the average patient, because that's the best we can do. The problem is none of us is average. Every one of us is unique. And one of the differences, or many of the differences, that between any two of us are slight um, changes in our DNA, in our genomes, just, just different letters at certain positions. In fact, we differ about one out of a thousand of these letters. And what we know as physicians is people are not average, but up until now we've not really had the way to look into their blueprint and figure out how each of us is unique. That's now changing because we now have the fundamental knowledge of the human genome, and importantly, we've developed technologies for being able to routinely read out a patient's genome. And now we are slowly but surely figuring out how to look at those differences and make medical decisions based on it. You brought up an important point there. This, this was an, an audacious project at the beginning to originally map the genome, but since then, technology has improved. We've come a long way since then. What advancements have we had since the original uh, plan to map the genome? Wow. I mean, it's been a spectacular 15 years. I mean, if I just gave you a highlight reel, the, the first thing we did is we developed ways for sequencing the genome for determining the letters, reducing the cost a million fold. That first sequence of a human genome cost about a billion dollars. We can now do it for about a thousand dollars. And a thousand dollars is a very reasonable clinical test. And so now this means you could really use this uh, for clinical care. Second thing we did is we used those technologies and we've gone from sequencing one human genome to sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes and making that data, those differences among all those people around the world available to scientists. So we have catalogs of the most common differences, different spellings in our genomes. We've layered on top of that a, a growing knowledge of how does the genome work. There was one comment you made in the introduction about the Human Genome Project it, it, that implied, and, and I know you didn't mean it, but it implied that the Genome Project was about understanding all the features of our genome. It really was just the most early understanding. In fact, just laying out those letters was the beginning of probably what will be a multi-generational challenge of understanding, interpreting all of those three billion letters that are in our genome. But we've made progress in the first 15 years. And then importantly, as it relates to medicine, as we've begun to use this technology and this knowledge for being able to figure out which of these spelling differences play a role in our health and disease. And we're learning a lot about the DNA basis of many diseases. Why is this a multi-generational process? That's an interesting word to use, but explain yeah. that well, a little I, you bit You know, more. it's part of it is to manage expectations. I mean, we, I mean, first of all, I sometimes make analogies to the literature, you know, famous novels or, or, or you know, great Shakespearean plays. We still have scholars interpreting those, and that's many generations later. So that, we're, the human genome consists of four building blocks that we abbreviate GATC, and there's three billion of them. And it's in, in some sort of fancy code. It's the order of the GATCC, AGGDC, somehow encodes all the information necessary for life. And we barely understand 
how it does that. We've, we've figured out the genes. The genes are building blocks in our genome that code for proteins, uh, or the genes code for proteins, which are the building blocks of our cells. And we know that inventory is about 20,000, but you know what? It, the complexity is much greater than our genes. It turns out we have all sorts of circuitry and dimmer switches in, embedded in those letters that determine where, when, and how much genes get used by different cells at different stages in your body or how you react to the environment and so forth. It is really complicated. And we just have to be realistic. We've only viewed these three billion ordered letters for 15 years. We probably know 10% of what we need to know. I, I think my children and my grandchildren will be interpreting the human genome and figuring out how it works. So how does having that information help a patient with a disease? I mean, yeah, give us some examples oh, of that. So there's some vivid examples. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about cancer. Um, cancer is going to be the earliest area of medicine um, affected by genomic advances. Why is that? Cancer is a disease of the genome. The reason cells grow out of control and form tumors is because their DNA, their genomes have picked up changes that make those cells grow out of control. We can now easily read out the letters of the genome of a cancer in that particular patient, in a given patient, and learn a lot about their specific cancer. And from that, we're slowly being able to use that information to better tailor their care. So much of cancer treatment up until now has been imprecise. We just try sign. If it doesn't work, we try sign else. If it doesn't work, we try sign else. We're now being able to upfront have information based on the unique genomic derangements in each cancer. It's just early days, but that's going to be a huge growth area in the next 10 years. It's one area. Second area, rare diseases. We are now to a point that you have a patient, you don't know what is wrong with them, you sequence their genome, and a third to half the time already you can figure out what's wrong with them. That is just mind-boggling. Six years ago, we thought that was impossible. You can do that with rare diseases, because rare diseases usually have a single genomic change that causes the disease. And then pharmacology and, and combined with genomics. Why is it that some people respond really well to the same medication as other people who respond incredibly poorly? Why is it? It's just imprecise. We're learning that there's slight spelling differences in each of our genomes that influence how we metabolize drugs. And so we're getting to the point and putting the two words together. It's pharmacogenomics, big word. But it's basically before you make a decision about whether to give a patient drug A or B or C, learn about their genome, read out their genome, and better select whether it's A or B or C based on their unique genomic makeup. Okay, well, if you've got cancer is one of the reasons or some strange disease that you can't figure out is another one, maybe not everybody needs to have their genome sequenced until you get to that pharmacogenomics point. And almost everyone takes some medication or will. So should everyone talk to their doctor about getting their genome sequenced, or where are we at in that Process. I think where we're at is, while I've given you highlight examples, um, even with pharmacogenomics, it's not that we know for every drug the genomic variants to look for to dictate which is the best medication or not a good medication to give them. We're getting there. Um, so I would say we're not quite there, but I believe in the coming years when we'll reach a threshold where there'll be enough examples, enough uses that people will upfront get their genome sequence and have it be part of their electronic medical record. But, but nowadays, if you're going to about to get one of those medications where it's indicated, people are getting pharmacogenomic testing done. Or if you're, you have a patient with a rare disease or patients with cancer increasing, they're getting genome sequence. What's the biggest obstacle to applying genetic testing to uh, everyday practice that a physician has? Probably the biggest obstacle is we're not quite at the threshold where where genomic information will really influence what most patients come to see their doctors about. And by that I mean, I, I talked about rare diseases as one category diseases, but rare diseases don't account for most hospital and clinic visits. It's common diseases, hypertension, diabetes, Alzheimer's, autism, cardiovascular disease, mental illness, et cetera. The problem with common diseases is they don't have a single genomic cause. Rather, it's multiple spelling differences in an individual's genome coupled to environmental, social, lifestyle features. And it's, that's complicated. And so we're not quite to a point of being able to predict. Maybe someday we will get to a point where we can sequence a patient's genome and say, wow, you are really at risk for getting diabetes, let's alter your life in such and such, or wow, you really might be hypertensive, let's have an early intervention. I'm convinced we will get there for some disorders, 
But in order to figure that out, we need to have much better predictive models. How do you get those predictive models? You need to do very large studies. That's why here in the United States, we're doing the All of Us Research Program. A million Americans are volunteering to be part of a big study. Multiple other countries are doing the same thing. We need to get data in the, uh, from hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, genomic data, lifestyle data, electronic health record data, data collected from Fitbits and other mobile sensors, and we need to crunch all that data in a way that we'll be able to tease out small contributions to disease and will help us understand the multifactorial nature of most diseases that physicians see. That last question. Sure. <clears throat> what, will it, what will it take and how long before we can routinely walk into our healthcare provider, get sequenced, and have their provider look at the results, make a diagnosis, or prescribe a therapy based on that genetics code? How far away are we from that? So I think it depends on the circumstance. For some things, that's becoming routine. Um, for some kinds of cancer, yes. For certain medications, yes. For a rare disease, yes. One thing we didn't talk about for pregnancy. The number one genomic medicine application today is, uh, is the use of something called non-invasive prenatal testing, where women who had traditionally gone through invasive procedures like amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling to get access to fetal DNA to look for ge genetic uh, abnormalities during pregnancy now don't need to do that anymore. A simple blood draw from a pregnant mom provides access to little bits of fetal DNA that naturally float around in the maternal bloodstream. And these incredibly powerful methods for sequencing DNA can be used to test mom's blood and will detect the same range of abnormalities that otherwise you required more invasive procedures. It is now predicted that worldwide there'll be four to six million pregnant women who get this non-invasive prenatal test done in the next year. That's the number one most used genomic test in the world. Wow. We've been talking about the human genome with the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, Dr. Eric Green. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Green. Thanks for having me.